I spoke with Jessica at our offices in Washington, D.C. Good to see you. Good to see you. Let's, uh, let's head on inside. She's the director of the Johns Hopkins Global Food Ethics and Policy Program and author of the book, Can Fixing Dinner Fix the Planet? Food itself holds a very special place in society because we're all experts. We eat every day. We make choices and we engage in this food system two, three times a day. It's quite incredible. I think we have to realize that we don't live in a bubble. Um, even though a lot of our social media and the, and the things that we're exposed to every day are in our, our, our isolated world, and probably right now we feel very much in a bubble as we all sit at home a year later waiting for this pandemic to pass. But I think it's thinking of ourselves more as global citizens. There's this big world around us. We're so interconnected. Our decisions matter. Previously, Jessica co-chaired the United Nations Global Nutrition Report and has advised governments and organizations on food policy. Her research focuses on the intersections between food systems and nutrition, agriculture, and climate change. In 2019, she co-authored a report in The Lancet that recommended major shifts away from our current dietary patterns. According to the report, quote, the food we eat, the ways we produce it, and the amounts wasted or lost have major impacts on human health and environmental sustainability. Food is a big contributor to climate change. It's, a, it's an instigator of climate change and it's a victim of climate change. And if you're gonna talk about ensuring that everyone gets access to food, climate is a big part of that equation. So this year, the UN, for the first time, the Secretary General has called for a food summit. And so food is having its moment right now, like climate had two years ago. Let's start with, because uh, there's two concepts there. Let's start with instigator. Uh, for yeah. people watching who don't understand how mm -hmm. uh, food is an instigator, give us a, a thumbnail sketch. So food, food systems, that's food is produced, it's packaged, it's processed, it moves to supermarkets and restaurants. That food system and all the actors involved, that contributes about 30% of the total greenhouse gas emissions in the world. That's a big number. It's a big number. Um, on top of that, food is contributing to a lot of natural resource declines and degradation. Water, land, biodiversity, all of these important components that allow us to have a diverse uh, diet and food basket, um, beautify the planet, <laughs> allow other species to live on the planet, um, and are just completely essential for us to be able to grow the kind of food that we want to grow. So food is also contributing and overusing and degrading a lot of those natural resources, water, soil, the biodiversity on the planet. So food plays a huge role in contributing not only to climate change, but to environmental degradation. It also plays a role in people's livelihoods. So when you start oh, talking yeah. about food, um, people tend to get like this, don't they? I mean, uh, talk to us about that aspect of it. Yeah, they're, they're, you see back of the envelope calculations because it's hard to calculate this number, but some estimates suggest 4 billion people work in the food system, in the global food system. That's huge. It's more than half of the world is, is garnering income and wages from the food system in some shape or form, formally or informally. So if that food system is no longer functional, it really hits livelihoods quite hard. There's something that you call a planetary health diet. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain that for our viewers? That is a diet that was recommended by the Eat Lancet Commission, which was a commission of about 40 scientists coming from different disciplines, nutrition and health, environment, agriculture, economics. Um, and together they, they established this planetary health diet. And that is a diet that is um, quite prescriptive. Maybe that was a bit of the controversy of it but it's a very plant-based diet. And that's a diet that meets nutritional needs 
decreases your risk for non-communicable diseases like cardiovascular disease and diabetes and stroke, all these long-term chronic, quite costly diseases, but could potentially stay within what's called the planetary boundaries, these earth systems. So a very low carbon, environmentally friendly diet. And the, the diet is rich in fruits and vegetables, at least half your plate should be fruits and vegetables, uh, pulses, so beans and peas and other uh, legumes, nuts and seeds, and very low in animal source foods. So some animal source foods like eggs, dairy, meat, fish, but quite low. And that was the controversy of the Eat Lancet. It was a very, what they call, plant-dominant diet. Which, I guess, uh, when you are on the climate side and you say, we got to get away from coal and, and gas, and we got to go to renewables, uh, the coal and gas industries go bonkers. In this case, uh, you got an earful from the livestock people, right? Yeah, the yeah. livestock sector was not happy. Um, because if the world were to consume that planetary health diet, livestock production would need to decrease 65%. But what would that do for the planet? It would, it would make a big impact on methane emissions, which is one of the greenhouse gases. It's quite toxic greenhouse gas. So red meat, beef, cows, they burp a lot. It's called enteric fermentation. So they're burping out this methane as they chew their cud. <laughs> and, um, and other, but there's other sources. There's lamb, um, pigs, uh, sheep also emit methane. Um, so th that would make a big impact on greenhouse gases if, if some of the high consuming beef eaters in countries like United States, Brazil, Australia would come down. Um, raising cattle also is the biggest instigator for deforestation. So clearing land to graze more cattle. Now, there's a lot of nuance in that story. So if people were to decrease their red meat, what do they substitute it with? And there's lower environmental footprint creatures we can consume, like chicken and fish um, and other uh, smaller ruminants and, and animals. But cows are the big one, right? They definitely are big emitters of greenhouse gases. Methane is a greenhouse gas that is 28 times more powerful than carbon dioxide at warming the atmosphere. In one year, a single cow can belch 220 pounds of methane. You talk about social norms, traditions. Mm -hmm. I, I interviewed Yao Ming and he was talking about his work and uh, trying to convince people in China not to, not to partake in shark fin soup. You know, it's, it's a bad thing, but people love it and it's part of the tradition and the norms and all of that. Um, so you have to peel back a lot of layers, don't you? Yeah, yeah. But traditions come and go, and, 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 and some would argue that it's very hard to change people's behaviors, but it's actually quite easy. Think about gluten, yeah. how that has completely changed the food system. A demand, consumer demand-driven idea that gluten is bad, and it makes me fat, or it makes me sick, or it's toxic. And if you work backwards, in the food system, how that has completely changed the supply of food. Restaurants having gluten-free recipes and menus, markets having gluten-free shelves, all the way down to wheat varieties. Those that are breeding wheat are trying to remove the gluten from wheat. <laughs> and that is removing a major macronutrient basically from one's diet. That's a big behavior change <laughs> that has completely shaped the food supply, all answering to that demand of what they think consumers want. So I think some of these traditions wax and wane. You know, people, people change over time. 
Um, and, you know, a lot of that can be driven by social movements. And there's so many um, examples of how traditions can be important and they can define uh, people at a time and a place. But traditions are also meant to be broken. And that's not always a bad thing. Let me ask you about uh, the light bulb going off. I mean, was there one point in your life where you said, oh, food, climate, no, or was it right, right out of the gate? You're like food, climate. No, I was trained in molecular nutrition. I worked in a lab in, during my PhD. My, my postdoctoral fellowship after a PhD was all bench science. And after a while, I got tired of doing bench science <laughs> and I wanted to actually see people and not pipettes. And uh, I, then I was introduced to more international development. I worked with Jeffrey Sachs, mm. who's an economist yes. at Columbia, and really learned a lot from him about development and, and the whole team that he worked with. Got the chance to go to Africa and see how food is grown and that's really where it sort of clicked for me. It all came together of food and how critical it is to society, to people's lives, to uh, the, the vulnerabilities of growing food with the environment. And that was sort of where I knew, you know, you have a moment in your life where things click, it probably did for you as well, that you wanted to be where you are. And that's where it all clicked was when I was in Africa. An aha moment. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Globally, climate change is wreaking havoc on access to food. In places like Madagascar, people are eating white clay mixed with tamarind to survive. The country is experiencing its worst drought in four decades. The UN's World Food Program warns around the world, 41 million people are teetering on the edge of famine. That's up from 27 million just two years ago. You know, obviously someone who's been at it as long as you have, there have to be gloomy days. So give us, is it the glass half full or half empty? And, and how critically important is it for us to move on this quickly? Yeah, I think I am kind of a who's gonna wash the glass <laughs> as opposed to the half full, half empty. Like who at the end of the day is gonna wash that glass? I, I, I'm pretty, when I look at the climate numbers, um, it, I'm, I'm deeply worried. It, it, it is no joke. It is a real thing. Um, and it, and I get incredibly bothered when, um, you know, prior to the Biden administration, the lack of action on climate, we lost you know, four essential years to make a difference. Um, and as I said earlier, the clock is ticking very fast on climate. So I get quite depressed uh, and that, that also, the students are incredibly depressed. You know, I've had students come to me and say, should I even have a retirement account? Is there gonna be a world to retire into? And I don't know what to say. It depends, maybe. And that's where we need governments to be bold and take action, care about their citizens, care that there's food insecurity in the world. Like, why do we still have almost a billion people who are hungry? Why? Lack of political will, conflict in places. I mean, I, I do blame governments a bit of not taking more action. You know, letting, letting multinationals come in and, and, and control the global food system, a lot of power imbalance in that. Um, I've often been quite disappointed in governments. <laughs> I have to say. Shocking. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's incredibly disappointing to me of how little they care about food. Um, and they just, they've let private sector sort of just govern the food system, which is not uh, an easy pill to swallow for many people. It's not, you don't really want 
multinationals running your food system because their objective is not public health. Their objective is not environmental stewardship. Their main objective is to, they're beholden to their, to Wall Street and to economic growth. And that's what they're there to do. That's what they're meant to be there for. They're, they're trying to get profit, but that is not in the interests of where the world needs to move. Um, I think of climate and food and pandemics kind of in the same boat, you know, like people are like, mm -hmm. oh, this is terrible, but it's not something that you see pressing at you every day. And yet the pandemic really kind of the COVID-19 slapped us in the face. Yeah. This is real. Is there a benefit for someone who's out there advocating in, in your space that it came along that like, look, this is what we're talking about. These are serious things and they're real. Look what happened with yeah. the pandemic. Yeah, I think it's it has shed a light on the food system. And interestingly, with, with COVID, is that largely food supplies have been okay. It was prioritized. We have to keep food moving. We got to keep trade flows open. Where we really saw it hit was further down the food supply of food workers who interface with consumers. They were hit the hardest. They weren't protected. They lost their jobs because restaurant closures, market closures, and it shows how important those food system actors are to keep us well fed. And I don't think there was enough attention on them. And so COVID has really, has really amplified the importance of those, the delivery workers, those working in retail, the waiters, that whole group that is keeping us healthy and, 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 and fed. I think the other thing COVID has really shown is this link between zoonotic disease, how we're managing landscapes, um, and, uh, and, and climate. And as we use up more land and encroach on natural habitats where there's a lot of wildlife, we're destroying those habitats to grow more food. We're putting these animals at closer proximity, cr proximity to humans potential rise and zoonotic spillover events. So the, this is where pandemics arise. A lot of it starting from food. So for people watching, what steps should we be taking? And I clearly, you know, how we eat is, is going to play a role. Yeah. Diets really matter. They, they really matter if you want to address climate. They matter if you want to address your own health. Um, you want to live a long life. You want to feel healthy. They're important for animal welfare. They're important for people's livelihoods. So what you choose and where it comes from matters. If you want to, uh, to eat a diet that's more climate and friendly and better for your health, eat more fruits and vegetables for sure. You don't need to eat meat at every meal. Maybe you can be a vegan in the morning and eat meat at night. You don't need to become a vegan, but certainly increase the fruits and vegetable intake. You'll, be, you'll feel better and it's better for the climate. The, the whole issue of food waste is a big one. Most food is wasted at the household level. People buy more than they need. You know, food gets rotten in the refrigerator, so maybe not going to Costco and <laughs> buying like huge packages of things, freezing what you don't use, eat your leftovers. There's lots of little things you can do every day. And if we all collectively did that, it would make a huge impact. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.